All right, welcome everybody to week two, uh, week one, day two. And so uh, I found a pretty good tutorial on YouTube that will walk you through the next step in doing stuff with the Mixamo characters. And uh, I'll post that onto um, Canvas. Basically, uh, it's about 10 minutes of your life. Dude, dude goes really fast, uh, but it'll it'll have you switching out the uh, the mannequin with um, like a scary clown or something like that. So I uh, just run through that tutorial. That's your that's your assignment for Tuesday. Um, I, I want to actually lecture on sort of like game engine stuff today, and uh, I don't know. I'm lazy. I could I could just repeat all the steps, but meh. I'll just uh, I'll just toss that at you guys. So there it is. It's on it's on Discord and it'll be up on the Canvas assignment whenever class is over. So what I want to talk about today is how is how game renderers work. Okay. So we've got uh, we've got here Unreal Engine and it's obviously a very large, big, complicated piece of software with lots of pieces and moving parts. <clears throat> what it does ultimately though is that it takes a bunch of triangles and it draws them to the screen. Okay, so every uh, every object you see in this world here is made out of lots and lots of triangles. Even Frosty here, who appears to be like a couple of spheres, perfectly round spheres, is actually a bunch of triangles. The more smooth the surface is, obviously the more triangles you need to represent it. What about the squares? Uh, a square is just two triangles, right? So um, if we uh, click on uh, the wall here, you can see uh, oh, it's actually using four squares or uh, four triangles. All right, is it? No, it's, it's it's just two. The front face and the back face are both being drawn there. So uh, the front face is two triangles, and the back face is two triangles. That's it. Any square, any square can be drawn using two triangles, right? So uh, this whole thing splits this way along the diagonal. There's one triangle here, one triangle here. You don't see any seams and things like that. Um, which is actually an issue. Like sometimes, uh, due to rounding errors and things like that, you'll see seams, you'll see flickering black lines and things like that. That's actually one of the hardest and most annoying things to deal with when working on a game engine is actually rounding error. <laughs> um, what is the geometry reason for it? By the way, in the law of math, uh, the, the geometry reason is anything can be approximated by triangles. So if you get enough triangles, you can approximate any surface to a certain level of error, right? And so everything has been, uh, can I remind you if we can go over the concepts I'd requested today as well with a preprocessor or whatever? Okay, sure. Um, and so basically uh, it's related to like a, I don't know, if, I don't want to go too, too far off topic, but um, like if you have sound in, in the world, you can represent um, any sound wave as a combination of smaller sound waves. Um, it's like, have you, have you guys ever seen like a graphic equalizer or something like that? Um, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like, uh, you know, you're, you're playing music and the, there's different bars at the different frequencies and things like that. Uh, that's representing the overall sound wave as a combination of smaller sound waves and, and, and different wavelengths and things like that. And so if you've ever seen like an audio mixing station, they'll be able to, to increase and decrease the volume of different bands of, of uh, frequencies. Okay. So triangles with three sides are used since two sided shapes don't really exist. Yeah. A three is a, a triangle is the smallest polygon there is, right? A 2d shape is a, is a line. And so rasterizing a line, drawing a line to the screen is actually what we kind of started with in the, in the 3D world, instead of having these full, beautiful 3D shaded things with like reflections and stuff, if you played a 3D game back in the day, back in the 1980s, it would look like this because um, drawing lines is actually fairly easy. And um, yeah, uh, and they would just do the outlines of things. So um, uh, there was a, a, what was it called, Battle Zone? Yeah, this is what it looked like. So, you know, it would just draw, like, there you go, just draw the lines. And so all these 3D shapes would just be, their edges sort of would be drawn and nothing else. And 
And that was actually fast enough that, like, back in the original, that's... No, no, no. No, no. Uh, what was the 80s version one? That's, that's 98, that's way too late. Um, 3D tank game, 1980s, what am I thinking of? Battlezone, what did I say? What did I say? Yeah, but it's Battlezone, okay. There's just a, okay, all right. 1980, yeah, 1980, they had a 3D game. It was a two person, uh, maybe, or one person uh, game. They would render a 3D, a 3D image like that. And uh, you would shoot the tanks and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. So, um, 1980, 1980. Like this is this is like before, like Space Invaders. I think was, uh, Space Invaders might have been la late late seventies, maybe. Yeah, seventy eight. Uh, when was like mm, when was Popeye? video game was 1982 yeah so the Popeye video game was also one of the big breakout hits and um, you know this is this is the world it was in I, I remember going to a video arcade when I was five I was born in 77 and seeing Popeye and it blew my mind how good the graphics were and to be fair I mean it's you know, you know I'd still probably play a game that looks like this a pirate ship you know and stuff like that but so two years before that they had a 3d video game where you're in a tank so um Gotta go catch up on Python stuff. You me show you the basics. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Aaron asked for me to go over, like, was it including stuff? Things like that. Uh, made Doom in C++. They, they've made Doom for, like, everything. Like, I saw there was a pregnancy tester they had Doom running on or something like that. I think they ripped out the guts of the pregnancy tester and put in, like, a little embedded computer in there or something like that. But uh, what, did, what did you want? You wanted to learn over the concept of preposters and macros. Okay. Yeah, we can, we can talk about that. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's really mind-blowing, like, if you think about, like, how primitive computers were back then, like, you're talking about a 3 megahertz processor, a 3 megahertz processor doing a 3D game, like, it's, you know, it's been around for a while, it's, what, 40, I don't know, 41 years ago, yeah, this. Okay, so behind the scenes, all that Unreal Engine is doing is that it's getting a bunch of triangles and it's trying to figure out how to draw them on the screen. So at every point on the screen, if you look up at the sky, the sky is like some sort of like, uh, it's pretty trippy and psychedelic if you look straight up in, in wireframe mode. In regular mode, it just is a nice pleasant sky, right? In wireframe mode, it's, it's like the eye of God staring down at you. <laughs> the reason for that is because the... Uh, the the world is surrounded in like a, a sphere that holds the clouds and things like that. And so a sphere has to be represented by lots and lots and lots of triangles. And so what's going to happen is like, let's say we pick that triangle right there. Like keep your eye right there. Blue. Okay. So that whole, that whole chunk of triangle there is just blue. And what the game engine does, the ultimate goal of a game engine is given all these millions or maybe billions of triangles, and they've all got different textures, and, and I think this is actually an animated texture. If you look at this, I'm not moving my mouse, right? So these clouds are actually moving, right? Is that at the end of the day, for every triangle that is visible on the screen, it is going to put a pixel of color on the final product. And that is, that is what a game engine does, or any 3D engine, right? I talk about game engines a lot, but... 3D engines are used in, in more than just gaming, right? Like uh, if you do CAD, CAM kind of stuff, um, architectural visualization. Um, NVIDIA has a whole line of graphics cards designed for business non-gaming purposes called the Quadro line. Um, I don't know if you guys know that. They're like GeForce cards, but uh, slower and more expensive. So the way they justify them is they... Uh, uh, in the drivers for the GeForce cards, they turn off um, various optimizations so that if you try running like a, a commercial 3D CAD product, it runs really slowly on a, on a 3090, right, or whatever. 
So you have to buy the Quadro, and it's just a little flag, and the driver's like, yeah, I'm a Quadro. Make that go faster. It's kind of shady, if you ask me. But um, Businesses pay for it, so you know, what can you do? Um, so yeah, so given all these different triangles, we got, you know, how many triangles are in that thing anyway? I don't even know. It's a lot of triangles there, right? So for every one of those triangles, for every pixel inside of that triangle right there, it needs to figure out what color it is, right? What color at the end of the day, after you've handled reflections and lighting and all that stuff, what color is that pixel going to be for every pixel inside of that triangle? And that's, um, that's a big thing. <laughs> and so one of the things that I want you guys to come away from IS 50 B with is kind of understanding below the surface, what's actually happening in a video game so that you can, um, so that when you make video games, you'll um, be able to make things that work with the engine instead of against it. And maybe someday you'll actually make your own 3D game engines. Um, in the past, we have uh, we have done software renders in this class. It's kind of fun. Um, go on the server, I can pull up a little Doom style renderer I built in a class. Like we, we did it together in class. Like we actually just, you know, it was, um, Nick Muya, if you guys know him, and um, Logan. And so this is a, a Doom style renderer. So I'm using the arrow keys to rotate around. I can walk forward, I can walk backwards. And this, this was literally oh, something over here, yeah. rotating to face it. And yeah, there you go. So I'm, I'm kind of strafing sideways. And so, uh, yeah, with textures, it'd be a lot more clear what's going on here. But yeah, I'm walking away from it. So you can see it's kind of lit, sort of. Walk closer, walk away. Strafe sideways around it. Rotate my camera. Strafe around it. Strafing sideways. And this is running inside a terminal, by the way. <laughs> there we go. So you can move past that column over there. So if I strafe to the right, let's see. Here. And this was just written into our class we, we did together. So, um, yeah, and that's in that's in a terminal. That's not even we don't even have a frame buffer like you, you have. In a, there's no hardware acceleration like that's just literally just printing characters to the screen. Okay, so um, what's the difference between making a game engine and a game when it comes to tech stuff? Uh, by game engine, usually people these days mean like a 3D game engine, although that's not obviously always the case. There are 2D game engines as well. Um, I sort of use game engine as sort of like shorthand for 3D rendering and stuff like that, although that's probably not the most precise thing. So what's going on? What's what's happening behind the scenes? What's, what's happening underneath the hood here when we're in Unreal Engine? Okay. So... Cherno makes a game engine, yeah, probably probably much better than mine. That was two hours of effort there. So, um, but I mean, that was from scratch. We started from a blank file, and together we coded that in two hours. So, yeah, we could probably add monsters and things too to it. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm reasonably proud of that. It's not the best looking thing in the world, and the field of view is kind of wonky on it. But eh, I'll take it. So, is fifty b. Fall 2021. And so your attendance for today will be answering quiz questions from uh, what I'm about to talk about. So make sure you pay attention. And then your homework uh, to, like I said, just follow that tutorial I, I posted on Discord. It's seven minutes long or 10 minutes long, something like that. And it'll, it'll just show you how to integrate the uh, Mixmo characters we've already imported in there with um, the third person blueprint. So when you WASD around, it'll be animating a scary clown instead of um, the mannequin, which kind of looks boring and tacky. Yeah. I don't have a notebook on you. You need to find one. Eh, you don't need a notebook. This is um, OneNote, and my uh, OneNote is available online, so you can, you can view the notes however you want. So what are the steps? What are the steps in rasterization? 3D, 3D rendering, let's say. 3D rendering. How do you, how do you, how do you render? How does one win? How do you 
how do you draw a triangle on the screen? There's the question. How do you draw a triangle on the screen? Like you got a triangle, it's in front of the camera. How does it appear on the screen? You know what I mean? And if you can do that for one triangle, you can do it for all the triangles. You know what I mean? Hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, um, okay. So let's say the triangle is at, uh, um, let's say the triangle is 10 units in front of the camera. Um, so it's like at depth 10, however you want to express that. So it's in front of us, we can see it, that's good. If it's behind the camera, it's very easy to draw, by the way. <laughs> How do you draw things behind the camera? You don't. <laughs> Here's the fun part, you don't. I don't know if you guys got that reference, but whatever. Um, it's from Invincible. Uh, so let's say the triangle's in, you know, in front of the camera, okay. Uh, how do we draw, like, let's say it's a red triangle. It's just very basic red triangle. How do you, how do you get it on the screen? Okay, let's take it from the top. Here's, it. Here's how we do it. So, uh, step one, uh, we project, uh, we project it from 3D world space to 2D screen space. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> what the hell does that mean? Okay. Well, we've got a camera, right? I'm gonna draw it like a little eye. And the camera has a field of view. If you guys are PC gamers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you are a console gamer, you probably don't. Because uh, console gamers don't usually mess with field of view very much. But like, let's say you have a 90 degree field of view. Okay. Pretty common. Uh, 70 or 80 is more common for um, console games because you're sitting further away. So it's got a narrower field of view. PC gamers, you're typically closer to the screen, so it's got a wider field of view. You guys know what I'm talking about? Field of view? How wide the camera is? Yeah. And if, and if it's set improperly, it, it, vomit. Right? So, uh, for every camera, this is your camera, we oftentimes draw it as an eye, there's a couple different parameters. There is the field of view, there is the near clipping plane. Anything closer than the near clipping plane Is not drawn. Okay, why do we have a near clipping plane? Well, uh, let's say that you're walking through a forest and there was a leaf that would be drawn a millimeter in front of your face. That one leaf would block the entire screen because you know you're look, you know it's right there. You know, your camera is technically like, uh, you know, it's a hypothetical construct, and if you put a leaf in, right in front of the camera, it will block the entire screen. And so typically there's a near clipping plane that's, I don't know, like, I don't know, 10 centimeters or something like that. Like there's, you know, if, if things get too close, they just vanish. And uh, this can cause um, horrifically ugly uh, bugs in games, by the way. Have you guys ever seen like the back of an NPC's head vanish and you just see their eyeballs floating in space in front of you? Have you guys ever seen that bug in like Red Dead Redemption or uh, Skyrim where like it clips off the back of their head? Um, yeah, it's, it's horrifying. I don't know if any of you guys want to find a picture of that while I lecture. Um, but what's happening is that it, a lot of times in your clipping plane will clip the back of their head off and, uh, we don't draw the backsides of, of triangles. So the, um, step zero is actually cull the triangle. So what does culling mean? Culling means if we can't see it, don't draw it. And so this could be, um, if it is outside the view frustum, this is called the view frustum here. So you got a near clipping plane. You got what's called the far clipping plane. So if, if an object's out here, it doesn't draw. If an object's here, it doesn't draw. It gets clipped. Clipped means it's not drawn. Okay, and then also you have a front of a triangle and you have the back of a triangle. We only draw the fronts of triangles. The reason for that is because that allows us to throw away half of all triangles in the world. 
imagine you have like a box, right? Um, you can only see, this is the front, this is the front of this one, this is the front of this one, this is the front of this one. You can only see the fronts of it. None of the back facing triangles you can actually view because they're all blocked by another triangle. As long as you have a model that is fully like enclosed, you can't ever see the backs of it. And so we can throw away half the triangles just by um, only drawing the front of them. Now, sometimes you'll, you'll see something called two-sided rendering. Like if you have a sheet of paper, you'll just draw the front and the back because it's the same thing. Uh, but uh, you can tell if something is front because the, the vertices go clockwise or it depends on your engine. I think actually most of the time it's counterclockwise is front. It doesn't matter. You just have to be consistent. Uh, whereas if you turn them around, like if you, if you flip this around, you would have C, A, B, and now the thing goes A, B, C counterclockwise. So based on the direction that the points are laid out, you can tell is that the front or is that the back? You just have to be consistent to always have all of them be uh, clockwise or have all of them be counterclockwise. And it's a fairly annoying bug to deal with when you import something from somebody that uses triangles that are the other way because you see the inside of them but not the outside of them. It's a very weird looking um, thing. So we clip away things that uh, uh, if it's outside the view, view for us from, don't draw it. Uh, so like if an object's over here, if an object's over here, don't draw it. It's over here, too close, don't draw it. It's outside the far field plane, don't draw it. It's over here, don't draw it. If it's behind us, don't draw it. And so by clipping, um, we can throw away huge amounts of triangles. We just don't even have to process them. One of the biggest jobs of a game engine is to make games run quickly at high frame rates. So if it's outside the view, view for us from, we don't draw. If the triangle is backwards, backwards spacing, don't draw. Okay. If the triangle is occluded, don't draw. A lot of vocabulary today. What does occluded mean? Well, right now, uh, my face is occluding the, <laughs> the view for us from. You see that? So occluded means something is blocking something else. It's in front of something else. So if you have a giant wall and then you have a person behind the wall, if the game engine can figure out this person is entirely occluded, if they're entirely behind the wall, it will not draw it at all. If you can't figure it out, it'll try drawing it and it'll, it'll waste some time making all the pixels that don't appear. But if the, if the game engine can figure out this person is just behind the wall, we can't see him, uh, the, the wall's not transparent, for example, then don't draw. So we start off by just throwing away huge amounts of data. Out of all the millions of triangles in the world, we throw away 99% of it. So we only try, try drawing things we could possibly see on the screen. And um, none of you guys can find the, the eyeball glitch. <laughs> the reason why eyeballs glitch like that is because there's actually a, um, um, that's not what I was expecting. Um, because there's usually a separate renderer for the eyeballs, the eyeballs are actually rendered using like a different thing. And so it draws the whole eyeball from the inside and outside. So when you can see inside somebody's head, um, Why is it not showing? Um, back of head vanishing. It's a very common bug. I'm surprised it's not turning up. Weird. I'd have, to, I'd have to find, uh, search a little bit more. But it's like when the back of the head vanishes, you'll see these eyeballs just kind of floating there in front of you. It's really disturbing. Um, so, um, yeah. So once we know that a triangle is kind of in front of us and they're within the view frustrum, which is this thing here, a frustrum, frustum, frustum. A frustum is a pyramid with the top chopped off. That's a frustum, frustum. Such a good word, frustum. It's a, it's a pyramid that the top of it's been chopped off. That's this area here. Okay. And so a camera has a view 
thrust them set up. And you control that with the uh, field of view, near clipping plane, far cl clipping plane, that defines the thing. So, um, you know, you, you most of us know, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so what you have to do now is you've got a triangle, and you, the triangle is like in front of us somewhere. Yeah, let's draw a red triangle. Like I said, the triangle is like 10 units in front of us. It's like 10 units this way. Um, not 10 centimeters, damn. Uh, Let's say the thing is 20 centimeters away, either way. So the, the red triangle is 20 centimeters ahead, a little bit off to the side. What you have to do is you have to do what's called a projection. And this is linear algebra. We've talked about linear algebra before. There is a linear algebra matrix that takes the x, y, z points, the position here. Every, every point has an x, y, and z. And there's three points right in a triangle, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. And it takes each one of these three points and it runs it through this projection matrix and it gives you a point on the screen where the triangle appears. So that is a little bit off to the side. So it'll be like, yo, the triangle is like right here. And so it'll give you, it'll go from this to like, to like uh, screen space coordinates. So that's the uh, row and the column on the screen where that triangle is going to appear. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Nightmare fuel. Thank you. So, uh, is that from uh, Black Flag? <laughs> that's actually just somebody. Is that actually? Oh, that's from NBL. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, that's horrific. Yeah, uh, Black Flag. In the, the mouth uh, also are a separate rendering system. So, yeah, if you, if you clip away somebody's head, a lot of times you'll just have these eyeballs and mouth floating, floating there. Yeah, it's a, it's a real thing. It's a real problem. Okay. So step one, you're going to project it from 3D world space to 2D screen space. And then you need to... Step two. Um, like if it's just solid red, you're going to fill the triangle. Um, all points inside the triangle are colored appropriately. All right, and so this step um, is kind of a multi-step process. Let's get this out of the way here. So uh, the most basic ways is you just say for every point inside of the triangle, uh, color it red because it's a red triangle. We're not doing any lighting. We're not doing any textures. We're not doing any um, materials. Not, no bump mapping. Nothing. Most basic thing is draw a, draw a triangle on the screen, right? And um, and so how do you tell? First of all, how do you tell if something's inside a triangle? How do you know? Right? How do you know? How do you know if a point's inside a triangle? Like if I, if I give you a couple points here, A, B, and C, and I ask you, is this point inside the triangle? You can eyeball it, but how do you do it mathematically? Maybe map all the points inside the triangle, compare and see if any match. Uh, yeah, you could hard code it, uh, I guess. Um, but like, uh, do, you, do you guys remember how you can tell if something is to the right of something? If you've got point A on the triangle and point B on the triangle, and then you've got like some point here called point P. How do you tell if point P is to the right of this line? Do you remember? The tools, the tools of linear algebra that we have. If P's X value is greater, it's to the right. Uh, not necessarily. Like we could have a point here and its X value is greater than this one. But it's not to the right, it's to the left, right? So we got this line here. We want to see if something is to the right of us. Can I call my friends? You want to call your friends? Absolutely. Thank you. Do you guys remember the basic tools of linear algebra? All right, so the two basic tools uh, that we used um, were dot product 
which allows you to say are two vectors pointed the same way. And what was the other one? So if they're pointed the same way, this is one. If they're pointed in opposite directions. Oh, sorry. If they're pointed perpendicularly. Zero. And if they're pointed in opposite directions, it's negative one. That's dot product. What's the other one? Pains you to forget. Cross product. Cross product is the other one. So cross product is is something to the right or left. Okay. So which one are we going to use to determine if something is inside of a triangle? So if you have B, negative one means it's to the right, you have A and B, one means it's to the left, or, you know, a negative number, really. Any negative number, any positive number means it's to the left. And if it's zero, that means it is directly ahead or behind. So if the point's up here, A and B, uh, zero means it is directly in line. Yep. Basically the same thing. It cannot be real if it's on purpose for a game. Yeah. So, which one, which one do we want to do here? So if we want to see if a point is to the right of A and B, what, uh, which tool do we use? Cross product, right. So um, if P is to the right of AB, that's good. But then we also need to make sure it is to the right of B to C. So that's to the right there. And if it's to the right of C to A. If it's to the right of all three of them, it's inside the triangle. Okay. Can I click in here? Why is this not? Let me edit this. Okay. If it is to the right of all three legs of the triangle, it is inside. Okay. So, uh, given every point on the screen, um, you don't have to loop over every point on the screen, by the way. You can uh, just kind of loop over this area and see if it is inside the triangle. And if it's inside the triangle, um, you're going to you're gonna draw a red pixel, well, at least right now. There's, there's obviously more than that. Is there any uh, situations where people try to do math with the coordinates, or is using cross product always better? Uh, there's something called the barycentric coordinates, which is um, something we'll get to this semester. And you, you need that because you need to know how close you are to A and to B and to C. Uh, it, it's sort of the coordinate system within a triangle. It tells you how close you are to each of the vertices. And we need that if we're going to have different colors at each point, right? If you want to do something like this. Stamps get broken. Yeah, if you want to do something like this, where 
each of the points on the triangle have a different color, you need to be able to interpolate between them. And uh, so this is a software renderer we made last semester. And so uh, the triangles actually have a depth. They actually have a distance away from the triangle. And so when they overlap, you can see the closer one appears over the, you can see the closer one appears over the, uh, the one that's further away. I think the, the multicolored one is further away. So when you see it overlap, the, you see it penetrates a little bit because I think the three of them are actually not the same distance away. Okay. So, um, okay. So to the right, it's inside. Uh, basic um, renderer, just draw the color and done. Yep. So that is, uh, that's where we'll stop for today. Obviously we do more than just have red triangles on the screen, but that is, that is the good starting point for, um, a 3d render. So for every triangle on the screen, you do that. And, um, how do you draw it to the screen? Um, so there's uh, two buffers we draw to. There's two 2D buffers we write to. Let's see here. Let's move this out of the way here. Uh, there is the screen buffer sometimes called the fragment buffer, which holds the color of each pixel we are going to draw. So in this case, it's gonna be a 2D array. For every pixel on the screen, it's gonna be black, zero, 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 black, 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 except for the area that is within our triangle here. And the area within our triangle is uh, every point within that triangle is gonna be drawn as red, and so it will fill the triangle with red. Okay. Now, what if you have a second triangle? What if you have another triangle that's blue and it's going to go over the same spots? How do you, which one draws in front? Like if you've got a, if you've got a, um, I don't know, you've got a white box here and you got a black box here, which one, which one draws, which one do you see? Like when they're drawing over the same spot on the screen? Which one, which one actually wins? The white one or the black one? Why do, why do we draw the black one, Dolan? Completely visible, yeah. Um, yeah, Yui has it right. The one that is closer to the camera draws. So the, um, and uh, that's, I think what Dolan was getting at too. The, the black one's including the white one, right? It's not completely occluded, we can still see it. But the one that's closer to the camera <coughs> draws first, and then any pixels that aren't blocked by the uh, by the black remote control get drawn for the white one. And so whenever you draw two triangles, you have to not only record the color, but you also have to record how far they are away from the screen. And that is called a Z buffer. It holds how far away Z the pixel is from the camera. And so if we draw, if we try drawing to the same spot and that thing is further away, we don't draw. If we try drawing to the spot and the new thing is closer, we draw. You guys understand? So if you ever try drawing uh, if you try overdrawing is what it's called when you we have two different triangles drawing a pixel to the same spot on the screen Only one of them can can go into the screen buffer the frame buffer the fragment buffer whatever you want to call it So the one that's closer to the camera is the one that that wins And then you write that depth in there too And then if another one comes in maybe that one gets overdrawn as well And so you can have you can have a problem with overdrawing like overdrawing um, uh, Overdrawing is handled by the Z buffer, but if Z uh, values are equal, you get a Z buffer conflict. And uh, overdrawing 
too much and lower your frame rate. So if you draw a million triangles all in the same spot on the screen, all of them have to be handled via the Z buffer to see which one wins. And so even though you're only drawing what looks like a single triangle on the screen, it can actually be quite slow. If you have a lot of things all drawing on top of each other, then that your, 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 your uh, video card is going to run out of what's called its fill rate. Its fill rate, not P-H-A-I-L, F-I-L-L. Its fill rate is how many pixels it can pump into the, the screen buffers and Z buffers. So if you overdraw too much, then its fill rate will get saturated and your um, frame rate will go down. Yeah, and, and you guys have seen Z buffer conflicts before, right? Like, uh, uh, I can probably trigger one right now. Yeah, there. Yeah, I see that. See that right there. So the uh, the upper box has exactly the same depth as the lower box. So these two fellows here are exactly the same distance away from the camera. However, we work with floats, floating point numbers. And for those of you that have taken computer science, uh, you know the floating point numbers uh, have error in them. And so just based on the rounding, uh, sometimes if you have two numbers that are exactly the same, sometimes one of them will round up, sometimes one of them will round down. And so sometimes the upper one will be in front Sometimes the lower one is in front and you will get this flickering and tearing uh, look, which is just not very nice or enjoyable to look at. This is very common when putting things on the floor. So if you ever take an object and put it on the floor, like a cube like that, and you make it exactly the height of the floor, which uh, looks like I'm not doing here. So let's turn off snap to grid. If it's exactly, exactly the height of the floor, then you'll get that, you'll get that screen tearing effect. Yeah, anyway, you, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, uh, anytime, anytime things work out to exactly the same uh, depth, then it'll randomly roll higher, lower, and you get this really obnoxious flickering sensation there. And like I said, it's very common when you put things on the floor because like things like the text here are laying on the floor. And so if they're exactly on the floor, then it'll sometimes draw the floor and sometimes draw the text. And it's really annoying. So the solution is to pull it up just like a little nick, a little millimeter above the above the floor so you don't see it floating. And then it'll uh, do away with the, the Z buffer conflict or Z fighting. What do typical Z values look like? Can it be negative? So it depends on your coordinate system, Don. It's a good question. Uh, I, I consider Z values to be depth. So like a higher value is further away. But in some uh, game engines, depth is negative. So like negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. It just depends on the coordinate system the game engine uses. The only, the only advice that I have is to be consistent. And uh, I, have, I have worked with game engines where some of their matrices are right-handed and some of their matrices are left-handed. And that, let me tell you, is super annoying. Uh, a right-handed matrix means that the X, Y, and Z coordinates are like this. Uh, let's see what we have here. X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So X, Y, and Z, X goes into the screen the way that my camera is right now. Y is, oh shoot, uh, I'm mirrored on my camera. This is my right hand, I promise. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Y is going that way. And uh, damn, this mirror, this mirror thing's killing me. Uh, but yeah, if you can represent the X, Y, and Z with your right hand, it's a right-handed system. If you represent it with your left hand, it's a left-handed system. And uh, the matrix math is obviously different, like rotating things and stuff like that. Um, the math, you know, things just move from one spot to another, depending on if you're right-handed or you're left-handed. And uh, <laughs> this one game engine I worked on, it used both. And that was annoying. It was really annoying to deal with. So just uh, just be consistent. Okay. 
Got to go, Ben Court. All right. Uh, doesn't high Z value and UE4 put it closer? Uh, a Z, uh, the Z value here is up, up into the screen. Um, if, you, if you're talking about like in terms of the uh, screen space coordinates, I believe, I believe negative goes into the screen when you do a projection. So uh, if you want to, if you guys want to see what the project looks like in practice, I can I can show it to you. Then I'll answer your question, uh, um, Aaron. Everyone's leaving. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, where are you? Summer twenty twenty one. Where are you? There you go. So, um, so in summer twenty twenty one. We made a health bar above enemies, and so an enemy would be in the world, and uh, is my world still messed up? That's actually a good question. Uh, yeah, shoot. Yeah, my daughter dragged the uh, my daughter dragged the landscape around. So <laughs> everything's broken right now. Okay, whatever. So what what we did in. Uh, summer is we added a health bar to this guy here. And so what we do is we project his 3D world coordinates onto the screen so that we know what pixels he covers on the screen. And then we draw a little health bar above it. So if we look over here, you can see that there is a health bar. There's a little health bar. Stop! So there's a health bar above him. And what's happening is that we're project ah. Getting shot. Ah. Uh, what's happening is that we are projecting hit we're projecting his location. We're projecting his location and then drawing a, a health a health bar above him. Okay. A little bit off the side looks like here. Okay. If I shoot him, the health bar goes down and he dies. Okay. So what does that look like in blueprints? Uh, let me show you. Uh, content. Uh, HUD. First person. Let's see if it's this one. No, it's the other one. There we go. Okay, so uh, our HUD is drawing like the health bar and the portrait and all that stuff. All these things could probably put into be put into functions, but Here's, here's the part that I wanted to show you for today. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna get all actors of class security guard. So all the security guards in the world, we're gonna get all of them, and we're gonna draw a health bar above each of them. The health bar ought to be centered a little bit better. It's a little bit off to the side, but whatever. So for every actor uh, that's of type security guard, we get its um, socket. I think that used to be a socket actually. Maybe that's why it's not working. Okay. So uh, we are uh, getting, I guess, the location of its root bone in that case. And there's what I wanted to show you. So it, that projects from the world location of the security guard. So we're getting the location of the security guard. And that... Sh whatever. Target health bar. Oh, okay. So we put a spot in the world. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, we put a placeholder on the security guard where the health bar would be drawn. We're getting that. Okay. So, uh, reading the location of the, the, the health bar spot on the person's model, and we are projecting that 3D location into screen space. And, um, and so X is across pixels across, Y is pixels down and Z is depth into the screen. And uh, the Z value, uh, if the Z value is greater than zero. Okay, so a positive Z value means they're in front of us. Sorry, I had it backwards. So a positive Z value is in front of you. So the higher the value, the further away they are away from you. And negative means they're behind you. Okay. Is this a famous attack of the floating boxes? Yeah. Yeah, so my daughter hates them, by the way, because she, she, she spends hours, like, moving things around, and she builds... Um, like she built this whole water temple thing. 
um, in about an hour. This area over here. But my uh, my term damn it, uh, my terminator box is always coming after. Yeah, we 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 do need to fix the landscape on this. This is a little a little obnoxious. Um, And so, uh, yeah, my daughter built this whole, this whole water. It's all <laughs> the landscape got moved into it. Uh, it'd be a lot more impressive if, uh, if uh, the landscape wasn't broken. But uh, yeah, there's waterfalls and, and things like that over there. Um, yeah, that took about an hour, and she's been building this this hotel here, as well, which the landscape is now inside of. Yeah, it's about an hour hour work for each of those or something like that. No, the hotel she's probably put a little more in. Anyway. Yeah, so the, the boxes come out and try and kill you, and uh, <laughs> it annoys her because she kind of wants a nice peaceful process. But that's that's the that's the thing for today is that. So that that uses the camera's um, uh, projection matrix to take something in world space and choose which pixel on the screen it is. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the boxes go right through walls and stuff like that too. They don't stop, they don't rest. They just go until you're dead, like the Terminator. All right, so, um, yeah, I think that's I think that's good for today. So basically, you, uh, you have a triangle, you take it from world space into screen space. Screen space means the pixel X, the wrong column on the screen. And then you fill that with color and you write down how far away it is. And then if you have another triangle that overlaps it, then you, um, draw, let's say red's in front, the red will win, and the, the blue pixels will be behind. Okay. So uh, Aaron, let me uh, let, stop there, and then Aaron, I will answer your question about hashtag defines and macros and things like that as well. Let's see here, let's pull up putty. Okay, so, um, then Aaron .cc. So if we've got a program, then um, you know you know what hashtag include is right. It's like uh, it copies and pastes a header file into your into your file more or less. So when I hashtag include public read.h, it is copying all of the text from public read.h and putting it right there on the screen or, or in the in the file rather. Okay. Now there's some other hashtag stuff that all the hashtag stuff are called preprocessor commands. And uh, the C++ committee has been uh, deliberately trying to make them irrelevant as much as possible because they are a pain to deal with from a kind of a high level systemic perspective. So first of all, there's a thing called define hashtag define. So I can hashtag define Coolio to be 420. And then if I see out Coolio, prints 420. So this is, for all intents and purposes, the same thing as constant Coolio 420 equals 420. But this code will not work. Why? Because I've defined Coolio to be 420. What hashtag define Coolio does is every time the word Coolio appears down below, it does a search and replace, a textual search and replace, and replaces Coolio with 420. So my code now says const int Coolio uh, equals 420. Okay. So uh, I, I can't do this. This would work if I had, you know, const Coolio equals 420 like that. Why? Because this is just a regular variable. This is a regular variable. This would work. With a hashtag, it actually searches and replaces every time the word Coolio appears and replaces it with the word 420, and it will not compile. This is fine. Bad coding style, probably, because you got two different constants with the same name and the same variable, but it's okay. You can have two different variables with the same name as long as they're in different scopes. If they're in different scopes, they will just shadow each other, and that is fine. It's, you're probably going to hurt somebody's head if you do this, but... Um, um, yeah, it'll print 400 because we're using this Coolio instead of this Coolio. So, in general, hashtag define is uh, bad practice in general. Yeah, in general, bad practice. Don't use it unless you have to. Sometimes you have to. There's there's some very clever things you can do 
find f of x equal to x times 2 or something like that. And then now it's 800. Why? Because I defined a macro. So I just made a function called f of x that every time you see f of x, it does a search and replace. It's not a real function. It's not a function. This is at compile time. This is not executing a function at all. There's no function overhead. It is going to search and replace, and it is as if I had written const uh, see out coolio times two. That's actually what's happening when I do the f of x there. And so a lot of people like macros because functions do have function overheads. There, you have to push the parameters onto the stack and pop things off the stack. And so uh, people like these function macros because there's no there's no overhead. It just does a search and replace. It's like your code's running in the compiler instead of at runtime. So, so the committee has done away with these as well. You can now do const expr int f int x return x times two. Let's see if I remember the syntax for this. Eight hundred. Yeah. So this is uh, rather than using. Uh, Rather than hashtag define f of x, x times two, uh, use this. Okay, and so const expr means the compiler runs it, more or less. Okay, so the compiler will actually compute what value uh, f of Coolio should have, and it's like, oh, it's eight hundred, and it will actually be faster than the macro version because the macro version will still do the multiply. It'll it'll turn into four hundred times two. So at runtime, it'll still turn into 800. Probably the optimizer would get rid of it. But the fact remains is that you can actually run code in the compiler. The, the compiler actually runs f of x now. And it only works on things that are, de that are determinable at compile time, right? Like if, um, if Coolio, uh, if Coolio, if we did like cn into Coolio, then um, this, would run at runtime and not at compile time. Okay. So yeah, so const expr basically allows you to run code in the compiler. That the compiler will figure out what the value should be and put the values in there. Okay. Uh, I was planning on using this for OS compatibility. Yeah, that's a very common use. And so there's something called if def. So if def is very very common. And so you'll see things like if def, if def uh, Linux or uh, if def uh, cpp, um, what is it? CPP. C plus plus. Yeah, that's the one you're asking about, right? Yeah. So what you what you can do is um, is this, right? So const expert doesn't exist prior to modern C plus plus, right? And so what you can do is you can say if def C++ is greater than 2017.03L, which means we are using um, 2017 or above, do this. Else if, elif, else if, elif, elif uh, int f int x return x times 2. So compatibility. And then you have to do hashtag end if. And so uh, what this means is that if you were using C++ and above, it will use const expert. And if you don't have uh, if if you if you don't have C plus plus twenty seventeen or above, it will default to the old. Just it'll be a function call. Okay. Or you could maybe hashtag define f of x uh, x times two. So there you go. So if you're using C plus plus twenty seventeen or above, do this. If you're not, do it the old way. Now this is this old way is really uh, it's not great because it's not a function. It won't show up in a debugger. If your code's crashing within this function, there's no function. It's literally searching and replacing your code and replacing your code, which can be good from a you know speed perspective, but is bad because it actually makes it really hard to debug your stuff. And if you're missing like parentheses and things like that, you can actually end up with uh, very strange results. Um, So let's say f of x times 
2. So f of x is supposed to subtract 2, right? So it's supposed to give us, it's supposed to give us um, 398, right? Uh, yeah, I can't see into it. So uh, it's supposed to give us 398, then we're going to multiply 398 times 2, right? Wrong. Wrong. We do not get 398 times 2. It looks like it should be 398 times 2, right? Because f of f of Coolio is 398, right? It's a function call, right? So it should be 398 times 2, which is uh, 796. We're not getting 796, Aaron. We're not getting 796. We're getting 396. Do you see why? Do you see what's happening here? I'll put the math up here for you. Coolio minus 2 is equal to uh, 398. 398 times 2 is 796. So we are getting 396. This is why macros are dangerous and you shouldn't use them. The hashtag if def stuff. If you're going to use that for platform compatibility, if def Linux, if def win Windows, if def Mac, that's all a okay. That's a okay, and you can just use this kind of construction there to have one function for calling Windows, one function for calling Linux, one function for calling Mac OS system calls or whatever. A okay. I don't recommend doing that though. I'd actually use like like a um, SDL or something like that. There would be an interoperability layer because all the different windowing systems are a pain in the ass to deal with. And you really don't want to be the guy that has to figure out uh, how to create a window and things like that uh, from, from scratch using system calls or whatever their foundation libraries are called. Use the SDL or use SFML and or QT or one of these other uh, MGUI. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there that handle that in between your code. Then they handle making a window. Then there's the operating system. Then you don't need to do so much cross-platform stuff, but sometimes you do. And, and you know, that was my job for years, by the way, was handling, porting between different operating systems and handling the differences and the very small, sometimes undocumented changes made between them. Um, not fun. It's not a lot of fun. So do you see why this is, uh, do you see why this is uh, 396, Aaron? Do you get that? Why is it why is it 396? Why are we getting the wrong number here? It looks like a function call. It is subtracting before multiplying. That is correct. But it's a function call. Shouldn't a function call take place first? Look, we just got 796. If it's a if it's a function call, it calls a function, passes in 400, subtracts 2, gets 398. Then it multiplies by 2, we get 796. Everything's correct. All right. 796. Now let's compile our code with C++11. Elif, uh, not Elif, just else. All right. Um, 396. So our code is now horrible. Our code is now super horrible. And it looks like it should it should be fine, right? Like if we're using C17 and above, we're using a const expr function here. And if not, we're gonna default to um, a macro for the same kind of runtime speed. And in fact, when we test it on its own, when we test it on its own, in fact, 398, if we compile it one way, if we compile it to C17, we get the same answer. It's correct. We've tested our code. It's correct. Except, except, except. There is, this is textual search and replace. It is textual search and replace. So when we uh, put in f of Coolio times 2 here, and we're using the macro version, this turns into x minus 2 times 2. So it is a, yeah, exactly. It is, it is literally becoming x minus, minus 2 times 2 which is the same thing as x minus four due to order of operations. It is not a function call. It looks like a function call. It is not a function call. And if you think this was fun to debug, uh, try this when you're in millions of lines of code and people have defined macros literally everywhere. And you're trying to hunt, and you can't, you don't even know what function it's in because they're not actually 
functions. It is a absolutely miserable thing to deal with. And people use and love functions for years because they are faster. You don't have to, they can be invoked, they, they can be determined at compile time instead of at runtime. And uh, the SeaWorld especially, SeaWorld loves uh, macros. They love that stuff. So now we've got this incredibly busted program where if we run it in C++ 17 mode, we get 796. And if we run it in compatibility with C++ 11 mode, we get 396. Our code literally changes based on which version of C++ we compile it with. And, and when we just tested the macro and everything by itself, it was fine. It was only in more complicated situations that the bug comes up. And, and this, is, this is the kind of thing that makes um, people cry and be very, very sad. So it is highly, highly recommended that if it, any chance you can get away from using a hashtag type stuff, uh, do like move away from it. This though is you still got to do. It. So if you want to do like version checking or OS checking, yeah, yeah, that's what you do. Just be very careful that it actually does run the same way <laughs> in all the different ways, or uh, you you will open the gates to hell. What about in unit testing? I mean that. I mean that's you know, that's a problem, right? Because like we could unit test this this macro here and um, and it seems to pass the tests, right? Everything's fine. It's an integration testing that it breaks down maybe, I don't know. Or maybe it doesn't break down until years later and then you gotta try and figure out and then, and then, and then somebody just figures out, well, if I just wrap parentheses around this, fine <laughs> right it's like <laughs> you know the, the correct thing of course is to put parentheses here right um yeah gts uses lots of macros yeah you, you and that's another thing right so uh yeah macros are still around and you still have to use them sometimes and the, the C++ standards committee is very aware of this and is working very hard to get rid of macros or make them obsolete or make them so that they'll still be around, they'll still be supported because there's so much backwards compatibility that needs to support them. But going forward, you won't need to use them anymore. The reason why GTest and Unreal Engine uses macros all over the place is because there's functionality you can do with a macro that you cannot do with the language itself, not even with context for functions. And the biggest thing they do is reflection. So reflection is when you can actually uh, query the language itself. Like what member functions do I have? What member variables do I have? And you, there's no way of doing that in C++. And so they've been working on reflection for at least seven years now, something like that. Uh, I was at a panel in 2018 or something like that where they were asking people, hey, give us your use cases for reflection. And I'm like, I'm an educator. I'd like to be able to write a program uh, that says, did my student write this member function? Yes or no? Because right now, all I can do is try calling that member function. And if it doesn't exist yet, they get it, it doesn't compile and they get a zero. So what I'd like to do is be able to say, all right, for each member function they've written, test it, right? Like if they write A, B, C, D, E, for each one that exists that they've done, call A, unit test it, give them points, call B, right? But you can't do that in C++ right now. In C++, if they don't write one of those functions, it will not compile. It doesn't matter how much work they've done, they get a zero. And so that is one of the biggest gaps in C++ right now they're working on, on solving. And, and that's one of the reasons why macros are still around. If you ever look at UE4, um, there's like the U property uh, macro. And, um, and what you do is, uh, oh shoot, I got, I got a meeting in 15 minutes. I, I got a jet, but, um, what you do is, um, uh, you define a variable with you property and it's a macro that will, uh, emit all of this secret code behind the scenes that, uh, will result in the variable appearing in your blueprints. So if you have C++ code, there's no way for your blueprints code to know what your variables are in C++. And so you, um, you have to tag these things with these macros um, in, uh, in Unreal Engine C++. 
and then it's kind of blurry like you can see here it says U property and then they'll appear over in blueprints and so that's the glue that will connect together C++ Unreal Engine and Blueprint Unreal Engine okay and so they still use macros for that as well okay so um, yeah in unit testing same thing they need to know the name of the function they're in and and so when they emit the test data it'll say like test one passed test two passed test three failed you know that kind of stuff and so G test uses macros all over the place same thing if they had a reflection uh, library or capability in C++, you wouldn't need to do that. But as it stands, C++ can't um, enumerate how many member variables you have, what member functions you have. There's no there's no functionality of doing that. Java's had it since 98, 99, something like that. Ninety-five. Okay, something. Like that. Okay, all right. So that's it for now. Uh, did that uh, get everything that you wanted to learn about? Uh, I want to show you something. Should I just wait until the office hours? Uh, just send it to me now. Okay. Um, did I cover everything you wanted to go over, Aaron? C plus plus. Think similar to it. Preprocessors and macros. Yeah, I think that was the thing. You want to ask more questions? That should be it for now. Okay, yeah, just ask me next time. So. All right, so I got I got a meeting. I gotta go, you guys. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, do your homework, and um, I'll put up a little quiz on the uh, the rasterizing today. This is simple, simple stuff. Nothing, nothing to that. Just to make sure you are here and paying attention. All right. So, you guys, I will see you on Tuesday. Peace.